Pia Sirala is a violinist, trained in the classical world at both the Sibelius Academy, the Budapest Liszt Academy and the Moscow Tchaikovsky Conservatory. All of her studies happened at the most interesting time in recent geopolitical history and amongst the most extraordinary people. She is now finishing her doctoral research on the indigenous people of Siberia, a work that she started long before she even considered turning it into a PhD. She visited these remote places and experienced local culture and ways of life, while also recording this ancestral way of singing that she calls personal song. Her work is raising some of the most thought-provoking questions about the meaning of music in both the folk and classical music fields. Some of her thoughts about the meaning of harmony, rhythm, are described in a three-dimensional way that makes it easier for everyone to understand. Our conversations have often developed from her research field to mine, with conversations about temperament, modern and ancient notions of tuning, drones and of course bagpipes. Pia is one of the brightest, funniest and most engaging people I have met in Finland and it is always an absolute pleasure to talk with her. She is a true storyteller and her adventures are well worth listening to. This is 40 minutes of chat around music and Finland with Pia Sirala. Anyways, thank you for, for coming and I hope it's not too hot. Well, I like hot tea. Yeah. This is from the middle of the Atlantic Ocean and I'm not making a joke. Meaning? The tea it was produced in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> what is it then? There is a set of islands, of Portuguese islands, that oh. are placed in between America and Europe, in the middle, a source. I should know. I don't know. No, no, don't worry. That's, Nobody that's, knows. No, Nobody. it's not. So, is anybody living there? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, several islands. It, it's beautiful. You have to, to go there. And they produce tea there. So in a sense, it's because Portugal is an European country. And that's Portugal. Then. Yes. So it's the only European produced tea in the world. So how... Oh, that would be interesting. They always mm. say that Ireland is the most Western country. And maybe Portugal is. How they far? say Ireland. Uh, who, who? I, Irish Republic, that that's the no. most Western country in Europe, but... In, in that Pope sense, Pius no. <laughs> yeah, I was just thinking. Because... Yeah, continental Portugal, yeah, but yes, probably yes. they're a little bit more off, but this is, in, this is in the middle of nowhere. It's crazy. Oh, interesting. Well, anyways. Yeah, very nice so, tea. <laughs> well, so... I... I saw some of your videos, mm. which were quite, su quite surprising because I thought you were a violinist not a National Geographic explorer. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what did you see. You must have seen the, seen the ones yeah. from the, my... Well, you showed us, um, you showed us your videos with, with fur instead of clothing and going with in those sledge. Oh, yeah, and yes, <laughs> yeah, yes. And then uh, you showed us a little bit of your ongoing composition. So you have to tell us all about that. Yeah, it's a very long story. It's a very long story. Did you, stu did you study in Russia already when you, when you studied violin? I started here in mm. Siberia's Academy. And then um, I continued on. I met, we had this, all these summer music courses. I mean, mm. they're very popular in Finland. I met my Hungarian teacher, the, the, mm. my, my Hungarian violin teacher there. And I wanted to continue my studies in Hungary. Mm. So I was there for a while. And then, but my, my dream was always to go to Russia to study because mm. a lot of good Russian uh, violinists, I mean, mm. a lot of them have visited all that time with the still Soviet Union. They yeah. visited Finland. I saw them all in my childhood. So that yeah. was my dream. 
I was always so sad that, you know, the famous Russian lioness, David Oistra, mm. he died before I had time to play. But yeah. I'm so happy that I went that early yeah. because um, the level of the conservatory was amazing mm. that time. And you could go every day to concerts and hear something that yeah. you just could dream of. <laughs> yeah. and, and it, it is wonderful. We had this, already hungry, we were used to that fact that students have a special lobby in a special special balcony, yes. second balcony, yeah, so yeah, to speak, yeah. where we could go to all the concerts yes. without yeah. restrictions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In Russia, it's a bit more complicated, but still, uh, you could get special tickets mm. as student to go to the concerts, and that was kind of the learn. That was part of the learning. It yeah, wasn't just, just, just yeah, here, yeah. here, here, here. Yeah. yeah. So I didn't. I didn't speak any Russian when I went there. But again, it was very organized. They had the foreign students language school mm -hmm. within the uh, conservatoire where also we had a wonderful teacher there. And, uh, so you said the level was very high and we, I mean it's kind of this kind of um, maybe a romantic kind of view of the Soviet Union so it was very high were they strict or did you felt that the teachers were kind or was it this 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 uh, it was more strict. Uh, yeah. more strict. Um, did you felt did did you you kind of fit in that system you felt at home? Did did you struggle at first or? Oh, I, mean, I was uh, first of all. <laughs> I went to my first lesson and it's a, it's a joke or it was. I had uh, she, my teacher said me something in Russian. She didn't speak any other language. Mm. I didn't speak any Russian. So she <laughs> tried to mimic what she wanted to say, and I got it wrong, and I just came back, to it, all the people who were not living, who were not Moscovites, yeah. they all lived in a one student hostel. Yeah. So that was just, that was different from Hungary. That, that was already something that, that the student life was very intense mm. because we knew all, it, yeah. all each other. So already in the first days, uh, I met this really wonderful, she's Albanian, but she was living in Kosovo. Kosovo at that time wasn't yeah. separate country. It was part of Yugoslavia. <laughs> and, uh, but she spoke very good English and sp she spoke Russian. She had been in Kiev. Again, Kiev was part of okay. Ukraine, was part of <laughs> yeah. Soviet Union. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, I just cried and I said, I have made my mistake of my life. This is the disaster. I don't understand anything she wants. And I said, this totally contradicting everything that I had learned. And uh, she came to my next lesson and translate it for me. Okay. And I had just misunderstood everything. And actually, uh, my, my teacher, uh, she loved that story. She was, tell it again. How was it? How was it that you got it wrong? And <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but that was a motivation to learn the language quickly. Yeah. Because just you needed it. And so all those international students that you met, that I, I guess you... You, you all become very, very, very tight, very, very good friends. Is that how the, the, the orchestra starts with the, um, with the Irish woman as, as um, a conductor? Originally, yes. Mm. But actually, she should be, you should be inviting her because I'm now telling her stories. <laughs> well, <laughs> because this, this all comes to the, <laughs> the people that are living over the Arctic Circle. That's how you got there, right? Yeah. Anyway, uh, um, Originally, mm. the very beginning of it was like that, and there was a practical reason. Mm. We were not again allowed to play in the same orchestra with the Russian colleagues. Yeah. So we had this, this really bad quality, it really horrible student orchestra. I didn't even go there <laughs> ever. And the, why, why was it bad? It, the conductor, so called conductor, <laughs> uh, he was more interested in smuggling a uh, valuable <laughs> instrument out of Russia. <laughs> and thanks to him, they brought this rule about passports for instruments. Okay. Because it became, the, he used also foreign students to smuggle. So it wasn't instrument. caviar. It, oh, it, it wasn't was, caviar, it, it was valuable it was. instruments, <laughs> yes, indeed. So um, anyway, she started uh, just string the orchestra, but, uh, and we performed somewhere, but then... There's a situation where our double bassist got ill. Mm. I don't remember, she was from Latin America somewhere. Mm. I remember correctly. And her roommate came and said, I, can, I know the repertoire I could play. He was Russian. 
And Lijia said that, I'm sorry, I have solved the problem. And he said, you haven't, but you can't take me. You don't take me because I'm Soviet. Oh. And it was like that moment she had said that she decided that she's going to, this is not on. This is discrimination. And they falsified an ID for him so that he could, we had a contract in the embassy that he could get in with the falsified documents. S okay. So, and so, from so that time onwards, we started to get Russians, uh, hmm. we started to play with Russians. And, and then when we went, uh, when we actually were organized ultimately in, in uh, we started more officially in 1989. These were the times before 1989. And then uh, we were already got the kind of registration in 1990. Then by that time we had a lot of Russians, at least half of our mm. members were Russians then already. But uh, there was this idea of bringing classical music to people that would otherwise not have the possibility of watch a, a yes. performance like that. Yes. And I saw picture. I saw an actually an old BBC documentary. And I, the musicians in military planes and, and just going yeah. to the middle of nowhere. Yes, yes, yes. It's, it's, it's an incredible... Yes. I mean, I'm oh, sorry. I shouldn't be no worries. Um, <clears throat> originally, it came from the fact that in early 90s, hmm. there was a huge uh, devaluation, not just inflation and everything. It was a ruble basically crashed. Mm, yeah. It wasn't worth nothing. And people became... It just, People just became suddenly, for example, university teachers had to be driving taxis or, yeah. or engineers had to be selling shoes in the market or something, anything possible to make a make living. Yeah. And um, one of the things that happened, the, t the tickets for the concerts started to go up. The people couldn't pay. Hmm. To get, uh, the, 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 it was impossible to, to get so to some concerts. Was it a sign... Was this a sign of status to go to a? To, that's why the mm. the prices started going up, or, uh, or what, it could just... have been for those who put them up, yes. Yeah. But there were lots of people. Just they basically, I remember that was later on. But there was a this director of St. Petersburg Philharmonic, mm. who was we were supposed to play there, and he said that that. Um, what do you think about the ticket price? Because it meant something for us, of course. We could have yeah. got some income. And uh, we asked, that, what do you think? And he said, the problem is that people are going to the shop and seeing what the price of the bread is. And they, they choose between, do they buy the bread or yeah. do they come to the concert? Yeah. So we said, let's have it for free. Yeah. And we started this system where we subsidized people, either with very little small income. ticket price, yeah. Or, or free tickets. And then we made friends of our ensemble who subsidized those people, that mm. they paid better prices or we got okay. some sponsorship and all that kind of stuff so that we could, um, so that the performances could be uh, accessible. Yeah. And it started from that, that not, not first the geographical distances, okay. but actually the fact that those who don't, can't have a possibility, financial other possibility, yeah. To, and it, that kind of became our mission. Yeah. And then the other situation was where we started to realize that when Soviet Union collapsed, there was a system during Soviet Union that all Soviet artists traveled. Along. They had they were obligated. They, it was obligatory for them to travel around Soviet Union to give a certain amount of concerts. Okay. And suddenly that stopped. And there were all these wonderful halls hmm. and wonderful audiences, and nothing. So that was how we started to travel. Okay. Uh, because we realized that that uh, that uh, that is um, that there is a kind of a need for it. So if you think invest in Europe when you have a concert or something like that, how much money goes to advertisement? Hmm. In those days in Russia, nothing went for advertisement. You had the audience. Okay. Or the, you had to raise money to get to some place yeah. or pay the musicians, but no advertisement. Sorry. No, no let advertisement. Me, let me fix this for you. Because you might not be having sound. Okay. All right, yes. Yeah. Okay. So, that, remember when we came first time, to, we toured Western Europe, and then there was a situation about 
how much this costs or how much should we have money for this or that and mm. other and then that was a big contrast. It was almost like you were living in two time yes. zones. One of them was our time in Western Europe yeah. and the other was the time in 50 years back. Yeah, like yeah, how yeah, our yeah, parents yeah. would have lived yeah. or grandparents would yeah. have lived yeah. in a certain way. Yeah. When was the first time that you were at, at that time you were within wait yeah i was gonna ask because i was gonna say at that time you were totally within the classical music world yes totally. but who was your hungarian teacher wasn't he a disciple of bartok what was uh, that did you felt yes. at the time already some connection with the folk world or... yes hmm. i forgot to say that in hungary yeah. again in the Academy of Classical Music, it was obligatory to everybody to study folk music. Mm. So it was probably started by Kodai. And, uh, and um, so Vikar Laszlo, who was one of the very few students of Bartok and Kodai, mm. he were carrying out those classes. So I went to them. Okay. So that was my... Um, Introduction. Yeah, absolutely. And... Um, I didn't and have and to... what an introduction. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It was, it was, it was really yeah. wonderful. And, um, and anyway, folk music was so much kind of part, part of the... You, suddenly, you knew the Hungarian folk music. Mm, yeah. it, was just, it wasn't just for some folk, music, folk musicians, it was for everybody. It was part of, very much part of the education. Did you find that anywhere else in the world until today? I don't think so, actually. Interesting, right? I don't think so. Because when you say that folk music was mandatory for every classical student, it's like, yeah. that's, like, it seems so futuristic. <laughs> doesn't it? Doesn't it? I mean, how useful it would be. Yeah. How useful it would be, yes, 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 Incredible. absolutely, yes. And it, the, the kind of the way to... I think one, two things that affected me was, I think that... I didn't know that much about Finnish folk music, to be honest. Mm. Of course, I knew Kalevala, I knew that it has been sung, those poems and so on. But I didn't really, I again knew Kalevala or the, or the folk music through Sibelius music, because okay. Sibelius was influenced by folk mm. music, especially his certain works more than the other. But um, the Hungarian folk music, because when I was a child, I started with piano before I started violin playing. Okay. And Bardock's Microcosmos, which is partly played based on folk music, mm -hmm. was one of, the, one of the music I learned. And that was my opening my eyes to kind of contemporary music. How old were you when you... Uh, eight, nine. And could you, could you understand it? Could you, was it this connection between... Folk music was was it immediate for you or someone? I explained? didn't think about folk music. No, no. Yeah. it was just. It was that... just the music was different. It was, yeah. it was. Actually, this is one interesting thing about Perfect Fifth because. I, <laughs> I love this. Where you always get into, with me, you always get into temperament. <laughs> no, no, because I, that yeah. is such a very we had this conversation in last yeah. seminar. Yeah. So I believed in it, and anyway. It's no, it's long time further, but, yeah, but I have you... stopped believing in it, yeah. and I tell you why later. But anyway, uh, somehow, just the world which was, it was just opened some kind of new way of listening music, okay. and that helped me to then later on listen other contemporary composers. Bartok was my no opening to that world, so to speak. So you get that experience. Then you go to Moscow, where all these exciting things are happening, and you are, you are privy, privy to to all these wonderful performers and all the array of classical music. Yes. But is is it still Bartok, uh, not Bartok because it was a disciple? But is is it still the this Hungarian kind of influence? Because you could forget, you could maybe have forget all. No, it, it, it. It, no, no. You kept it. You kept certain, it I, you probably sure that you have the same. That mm. there's certain personalities as your teachers you mm. will never forget. Yeah. He was one of them. He was just outstanding in his professionalism, and that was something that 
You kept. You kept, and, and I kept, and also, I mean, part of my love to Bartok has started from childhood. Mm. It yeah. was, I heard a lot of Bartok, of course, in Hungary, very little in, in Russia. Mm. Bartok wasn't played much. Mm. And, um, of course, he, uh, learning Hungarian language helped me to understand Bartok even more. Uh -huh. The written, which okay. is totally based on the language. How language do you speak in the <laughs> oh. How many language? So Finnish, Russian, English, Hungarian, Hungarian? and I mean I learned Swedish at school and and, okay. and German okay. at school. But uh, my Swedish is very like most of Finns. It's I can understand <laughs> it from, and I can read it from the German. Maybe that you studied as well. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. They are they are quite mm. similar. Yes. Yes. So I'm just trying to picture this in my head. So you're going to this very far away places, very desolate, that you go in military planes sometimes, or mm. very many, many hours, I guess, of transportation, yes. days, days, entire days, I guess. And then you meet these people that speak Russian to communicate somehow, but also have their languages and have their culture. Yes. And when, when did it click that there was something there that was disappearing in that you? You felt you had um, to do something about it. So that, that trip, that that uh, journey that you saw, which is uh, all you, the minutes, yes, that you it's break, a, you break the double list. Yes, not you, but someone. It was broken. <laughs> yes, it was broken by the yes. So um, that was the first, in a sense, that um, on our way back hmm. by helicopter, and then we came by bus. <laughs> And then it's just the normal way of transportation <laughs> for musicians. Actually, yeah. <laughs> Helicopter. Yeah. Uh, they, yeah. Actually, I, they, the pilots gave me possibility to drive the helicopter. <laughs> and I didn't, had no idea that the steering wheel is yeah. very sensitive. And, the pedal and I went like that, like in a boat. <laughs> and the whole helicopter went back. And then went like... I, I mean, the, the crew, the, the, the film crew, they were furious with how but I didn't know. And it's how, how would I have known? Anyway, the, I mean, the musicians kind of, they, they were not exactly kind of impressed by me. But anyway, I had no idea. Anyway, when we came back to the bus, this nene elder, or elderly lady, started to sing a song. And it was somehow just something very new, something very... Something music that I had never heard, hmm. and um, the film crew, of course, you know these big hairy microphones. Mm. That yeah. the, the the person came <laughs> and put that in front of her, and of course she stopped singing. Yeah, she got very angry, and then then we said, "But what? Please tell tell us what was it all about, and what, what did you sing about?" And uh, then she said, "I sang about you. I made a song for you, for, for all the group, the yes, whole group yeah. that you came to us and played for yeah. us." But would you remember how it went? Said, how would I remember? <laughs> I just make and then. But would you kind of? How was it? What was? What was I saying? And and, and just, we don't know what you were saying. You were singing in minutes. So she started to sing a little bit again, but she didn't. She was just yeah. singing something more. And what is amazing about this story is that one of our viola players in our orchestra, Ensemble Twenty One, got that um, that. Uh, Excellent. videotape that uh -huh. uh, which he uh, he made a, the, like it is a video version and he made it to a digital recording mm -hmm. and he had kept the whole thing he didn't cut anything and he gave it to me and i was looking at it and looking oh it's not that good quality you know video making it to mm -hmm. digital it's just and i just kept going suddenly the picture stopped and suddenly i hear this singing I said, I can't believe this. What is this? And it was this song. By act, it had been that, kept in the that audio. All the not... part was kept in. Yeah. So I have actually a copy of that. Okay. First uh, uh, recording that influenced the, the, the whole us. incident. Whole incident. She stopped being singing and everything then... was the only wow. yes. So, um, but that was the first. But mm -hmm. then our orchestra went to Sahalin. Sahalin is this island above Japan. It okay. belong, be, belongs to Russia these days. And uh, we were invited there. Uh, we actually met some people who talked about the indigenous people in Sahalin who are the NIFCs. Okay. And then uh, our conductor, Lisha, she spent, had a sabbatical in Sahalin. And she actually uh, 
met them. She visited the villages mm. where they had this festival and she vi visited them and she also met the local ethnomusicologist okay. who gave her recordings. And she was so impressed by that when she came back to Moscow, she said, you have to listen to this. You have to listen to this. And uh, so I did. And mm. that was the kind of the start first. I was asked to make a, some kind of a transcription of some songs mm. to, for <laughs> string orchestra or string quartet or something. Yeah. I said, yeah, 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 no problem. I do some transcription, so I didn't think about it. Yeah. When I heard it, I realized that what have how, I promised? Yes, how, how will I transcribe this? <laughs> yeah, because it, it's, it's, there's no uh, uh, harmony, it's lacking totally. So how do I mm. handle with this music, which doesn't have harmony functions in any understandable way that I can understand? So that was the starting point, and I visited Sahalin twice, went to field trip, but it was a bit different there because they, they had actually a railroad and mm. buses and so yeah. on. So Closer. Yes, Closer. and also the culture, there were very few left who could still mm. actually okay. master that. But Ulita, who was the over 90-year-old elder that I met, she was blind and she was... I don't know, have you ever heard of Finnish... Uh, um, singer and uh, who recited a lot of poems and Sibelius and a lot of artists mm. heard him in the turn of the century. She was from that part of, it's not anymore in Finland, mm. Larin Paraske. There's a statue mm. near, not far from Finland. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. She had a massive amount of uh, repertoire. repertoire you know, she knew all these, these poems and all that. This lady was the same, and she okay. could tell legends, she could tell, tell everything possible. And when she, generally when she told them, she was not talking, she was reciting. Okay. So that was my first piece ever that I wrote for, first for violin and singing orchestra. Not actually my second, sorry. Mm, it was yes. based on her. That, was all of this before the doctoral? Yes, that was... Before? Yeah, was I, just... went, I was just absolutely taken by that mm. music. And because my love for Arctic, generally, I have been several times in hiking in Lapland, and I like love that Arctic nature and all that. So I was interested in what is I heard about Kamchatka. They, they, everybody said it's incredibly beautiful. Mm. So I just uh, wanted to see what is what is the indigenous music over there. And uh, one of our musicians' girlfriend was from Kamchatka, so that was. Okay. She said that if you want to go there, then I'll take you. Yeah. then. Um, you can stay with my parents over there. Yeah. So I applied for Vihuri Foundation. Okay. I and uh, got the grant to travel there. But was that before the doctor? That was Still. before the doctor. Yes, that was in so 2000. You did the doctoral before you did the doctoral. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In 2008, I went to Sahali, uh, Kamchatka. Okay. And I, it was a funny. It was a some kind of conference of indigenous peoples, and. Um, Somebody has said, somebody, I can't remember anymore now, who, what was the contact? Uh, but I got hold of somebody who said that you should come and mm. come to that conference. And in that conference, during the coffee break, I, was just, I went to the table to have coffee with some people and I said, I wish I would know the most remote uh, village in Kamchatka, where, where, what kind of music there, who are these people? Mm. I knew that they're Karyaks mainly, so Karyak people, they were Itelmens and Karyakam, Kamchadao. I knew those names, but yes. nothing about their music. And there was this politician who um, said to me, she was so unlikely person to give me advice. She was this supermodel, high heels and really? dark hair and, and like million kilometers eyelashes. <laughs> and, 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 and she said to me, if you really want to, um, if you really want to, do you want to have a uh, well, intermission? Are you okay with the camera? Yeah. Yeah, because it's okay. So yeah. it's second to no. Yeah. Um, if you really want to um, go to really remote place that nobody goes, then go to Achavayam. And then where is that? And she said, it's a north, north uh, east uh, Kamchatka. Hmm. Said, How do I get there? You go to Tirichika and from there you take a helicopter. So the strangest person gave you the. The strangest person. <laughs> Best advice. And uh, because I was asking, they was, back in Sahalin, there was this ethnomusicologist who really knew her. her. Mm. She knew everything about Nivsk and everything. 
there's nobody in Kansa to, uh, could ask anything like that. So, um, and somebody was saying, oh yeah, yeah, if you want to make arrangements, you can, some, you can hear some ensembles and they can play and dance for you. I said, no, 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 that's yeah. not what I'm looking for. A real kind of the, the authentic, as I, those days I was, I had no problem with using the word no. authentic. Okay. Nobody was in the doctoral <laughs> seminar <laughs> questioning me about it. I said, I want to hear the authentic, original, all of these words using without any shame. <laughs> so I had to wait about a week because the helicopter, the, the actually the little, the, there had been an earthquake a few, mm. two years before that and no big plane went there. So wow. there was a small aircraft and it couldn't travel on that weather. So I was every day about one week going to and fro, to and fro to the airport. And basically in the end, I bribed the, the pilot. That was how it went. <laughs> to get to that, that, that plane. And um, but then I had the, the various people that I could contact. That there was some, a Chukchi lady who was working in the museum who would, I could stay in her place. And I went to Tilichiki, or actually there's hmm. this place where near Korf, which is where the uh, airplane, the airport is. So I stayed with her and then she organized, helped me to get uh, he next helicopter to Atsavayam. Because there are no roads, of course. Yeah. There was another option from Petropavlovsk, which is the capital, that you could go by road up to a point and then to take a tank. <laughs> but, and I was okay, let's, I don't want to wait these planes. And, but then I heard that it might take several months to get there, so I yeah. decided to skip that. I wouldn't have a visa for that long. So, <laughs> that was the only problem, it yeah, was the visa. That was the only problem, yeah. <laughs> It was February, it was quite cold that time. Oh. So I, I came to this village and it turned out that it was a Chukchi village. Hmm. Although uh, Kamchatka, uh, it's mainly Karyaks okay. in the northern Kamchatka and the middle Kamchatka. Idelmensa in the southern Kamchatka. But I, I believed in this politician, so I went to, and, but uh, it is to, the, to this day the most interesting village for from folk folk okay. music viewpoint or folk folk viewpoint. So slightly different people in a way. Yes, it's from another. What, yeah. yeah, from what yeah. you were expecting. Yeah, it's other ethnicity. Yes, yeah, other yes. Ethnicity. And um, so I spent there only maybe eight days before an next helicopter I took to another village. Mm. But it has that eight days was. I still value that. For me, it has been the, maybe the most important place, the village that I have been in all this area. Hmm. And of course, it was 2008. That's what I was going to ask is, you, you do get the feeling that this is all very fleeting, very in the last glimpse. Do you feel that? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Oh, definitely. This, this, um, I, you see, I didn't know this. Uh, under this, this so-called personal song. I didn't know what it was. Mm. So I went there as a musician, just like a person from Mars, you know. <laughs> I had no ethno... Th yeah. That training that I had in Hungary, it's it was a long time ago. And, and it's, it's different cultures. It's different, a different culture, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So I just went there and I said, would you sing for me? Who would sing in this village? That was basically... Yeah. And I lived with an Azerbaijani lady, yeah whose husband was working there, as it turned out that he was a poacher. Okay. So he was basically bri bribing, uh, having these uh, um, Chukchi who okay. illegally were catching fish and then he was yeah. taking the caviar and, and so on. So oh, it was caviar. That was, uh, he had an office, he had a shop, but the shop wasn't was the reason he was a front. There. For it was doing a front, the, yeah. the black market. Exactly, mm. yes, yes. I didn't meet him. He was actually not there at that mm. moment. Life was very nice. and um, But I got to know the, the lot through that shop, actually, because it was in the same, the, the flat was just behind the shop. Mm. Mm. So, but I got to know the, I can now remember how many people I recorded there in those days. And then this man, Etilian, who was then 70 something, he took me to Tundra to meet first time with the reindeer herders, the nomadic reindeer herders there. I spent there two nights, I think, yes. How, how did they react to you? Were, were they like, this lady is crazy, what is she doing here? Or 
or it's not even their own conception of that would be my conception right? yeah mm -hmm. uh, that what what is this lady for example what yes. are you doing in portugal which is a much more closer reality yes. but yes. it's a normal question yes what is a finn doing in portugal yeah what is a portuguese doing in finland just to rehearse i'm to, sure that you get that question yeah. often yeah. <laughs> you're, you're crazy you're, yeah you're yeah yeah so and and it's it's so naive of us because the, the realities are so close you know yes. portugal and finland i mean yeah i mean there's subtle in this regard very subtle cultural differences yeah compared to this this is like a different world it so is, yes. maybe i'm i'm going through my own lens yeah so maybe they didn't think that so mm. this is a lady there's yes. a lady here that allegedly lives very far away in mm -hmm. a place called finland and which, which they don't know where it yes, is which mm -hmm. they don't know where it is which oh, doesn't know which is very naive because she doesn't know how to you know how to eat how to how to protect herself you had to have help because yes. you were completely out of your element yeah so in a, in a sense they had to protect you from from mm. your own ignorance of absolutely you know? and for, for example clothing starting yes. from clothing yeah. I, I couldn't have gone with my so-called winter clothes i remember yeah. i had this very thick woolen scarf yeah and they smiled <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the, um, she said to me, the sister, there's a very dis lady who who had disability, but she couldn't move her legs at all. I don't know what it was. She, said, kind of, she could only move with her hands, but she was so agile and so quick yeah. that you actually forgot that she had yeah. that disability. She was fantastic. She was a fantastic musical person, and uh, she and her sister helped me that time. And Etilian this. The elder took me to Tundra. They clothed me, and, and this, I remember this scarf. And, and the sister was saying to me, "You can save that to Africa." <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Africa came uh, twice because I had only a very, I, I had a recorder which kind of bad recorder, and I was thinking in Salin I didn't have one. We had the professional one; it was stolen in Moscow. Long story again. Anyway. <laughs> And I went to a shop in Finland when I got the grant and, and I said, I would like to get some dictaphone or something. I said, what are you recording? And I said, I'm going to the, the far east to record music there of the indigenous people. And the, the young, it was a young man, he just looked at me and said, I tell you, if I was going to Africa, I wouldn't be dying buying dictaphone. I would, yeah. And then he, he told me what to get and this Zoom and yes. so on and so on. He got the continent wrong, but I'm the pro not the product. <laughs> yes. So I thank God I had that very very good recorder there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had a very simple Canon little kind of simple camera, yeah. but the the recorder was good. Yeah. So I had that was my equipment. So I'm fascinating about trying, which is impossible, of course. But how, if you had to describe how they were looking at you, could you ever? What were they seeing? You understand? Because yeah. we know what we are seeing. And what are they seeing? Um, like, this lady comes here and asks me to sing. No, she came first the reaction is that I'm Russian. Yes. And when they heard that I'm not Russian, it was, a, uh, it was already a plus. Okay. <laughs> so the fact that um, then I, they were asking where I'm from and they didn't know Finland. And I was thinking, right. So when when are, they don't know, do you draw? You no, don't try, I you was, don't try to explain. No, I was just saying, because I, I knew that that was a rain here in culture. I said, do you know where Lapland is? Hmm. And Sami people, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Just, that's just below it. That's the thing. Yes, is. okay. So we, in our north, we have, oh, so you are, so you are reindeer. I said, Finland, yes, part of Sami land is in, uh, in Finland, part of Lapland, and the Sami are there, and yes, they do have reindeer. Hmm. So that was a, uh, Oh, the connection. That was the connection immediately. Interesting. And immediately the questions, do they roam? Do they um, have, how many reindeer they have? How is the industry, how is the, how is it going there? And so on and so on and so on. Okay. So, um, so I had that, because Ulita in Sahalin, I had this, um, already the feeling that, that when you go and meet these people, you have to introduce yourself, you have to bring them something like tea or, or yeah. chocolates or something, something like, like a present. And um, <clears throat> just introduce yourself and, and not immediately say, I yes. want to record you. Of course. 
And then I had my violin with me. Okay. And I uh, often took my violin and played something for them. Okay. And it was fascinating for them because they have, lots of them had seen maybe on TV or something, so, uh, violin, but, uh, but uh, never alive. So that was also, uh, it was a bit kind of um, sly because they felt obliged to give me something to, uh, in return <laughs> because I had played for them. Yeah. It didn't always work, but they were, I have to say, during all these years that I've traveled there, there are very few people who have said, no, I don't mm. want to sing. Mm. Oh, but I mean, if somebody doesn't want to sing, they don't want to sing. It's up to them. You can't persuade them. A couple of times, because of being in a hurry, done that mistake that I have kind of immediately. Mm. Because of one or the other reason, some transport, somebody is hurrying me or something, and it has always been disastrous. So, okay. uh, hard to know, was it because they didn't know, or did they get kind of scared, or whatever it was, but... Uh, Generally, you have to understand that you have to have time, and you were lucky if you could make them sing the first day you meet. I was told the same story <clears throat> about recording people in Portugal in the 70s. So, uh, Interesting. And um, so I, I would guess that being, 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 hiring it would never be a good thing in any culture, I guess. But I was wondering, wondering if there, there is a particular reason and necessity for time. Because, and that's something you can maybe talk a little bit about, because of when the lady said that, well, this, this, was, this song was about you. Mm -hmm. and, and it's, and I cannot repeat it because it's one of a kind in a sense, mm -hmm. it's something that happened now. Do you find that there is, inf that takes preparation? It's not something that you can just do like that. So maybe, maybe even if they were, a if they were willing to do it, they wouldn't be able to do it on such a short notice. It, I mean? would say so that, because uh, it depended on what kind of person it was. There were certain elders who, who were accustomed to sing all the time. Okay. For them, it wasn't difficult. But then there were some other people who, because, of course, there are different types of chukchi. Okay. And if you now jump ahead, I later realized that, that my main interest is it in, in the tundra chukchi, with the reindeer herding okay. chukchi, rather than the coastal chukchi, who are walrus hunters. And they are more prone, they are more exposed to, to modernity, can you say that, in a sense? Maybe. The, the, uh, I mean, they have had more interaction with other, mm. other people, other cultures, and they also used to live in small communities, okay. but that was, but let's say Atsaravan was 60 year old village, village, and lots of these places, they were first, um, what is it in English? Like, like camping or mm. like camping, but they Camps, came, yeah. yes, they came there to, for example, summer, residence, some yeah. tents they put on up there. And then later on, they, Soviet, during Soviet time, they started to build houses and so on, that gradually that happened. So then later on then, let's say in 50s, it started only certain villages, they, they, because Soviet Union was already strongly in that area. I mean, Soviet, the Soviet revolution started in was 1918, but it didn't reach those areas for mm. many, many years. Yeah. But then finally they started to, they started to, but it was not viable for the Soviet you know, education and, and transportation and logistics to have all these small villages. Mm. They started to close them and force people yes. to go out from them. And they came to bigger places. Yeah. I think I would say that that was the time when the coastal, that my guess, 
but the coastal Chukchi culture was somehow crushed. Yeah. And lots of people felt that they were, un they were there's no reason for them. They have no, no meaning anymore. Yeah. Because before they were self-sufficient, money had no meaning yeah. in there. They were feeding their own village and all, all that. But the Tundra Chukchi, the certain portion of the population went all the time to Tundra. And almost all the children had been grown up in the Tundra, even if they later on ended up living in a village. Yeah. <clears throat> so I think that that was the reason that they were so separated from any, anybody else that, that their singing culture was, and also language skills were better generally hmm. than with coastal Chukchi. Lots of them have forgotten their language now totally. Mm. And I, w I wanted, if I wanted to tell you something and to share something with you because you made me think. So, when twenty years ago I started listening to bagpipe recordings, so in Portugal there is this remote, which is not remote, mm -hmm. but it's it, at the time it was like nine hours drive in such a small country like Portugal. Portugal is 300 kilometers by 700 kilometers. So nine hours driving is a lot. I mean, yeah. it's, nowadays it's two hours and a half oh. because of highway and a tunnel. So you understand. Yes. So it, it could get to eight hours or something like that travel. And there is this, this um, uh, plateau, this, this flat land at, at an altitude and there's a couple of villages there. And there's where the best remains of piping are in Portugal. And it's so remote that it's in a border area to Spain, mm. but actually in that border area, you have uh, at least three regions uh, that were old kingdoms that then fell under by marriage and so on, then were all... Um, conglomerated and became Spain. Okay. Okay. So it's Asturias, it's Castelo and Leon, and then that's inside Portugal, which is Portugal because somehow Portugal was a medieval king that was able to stand alone. So in there in that area they speak a language which is the old medieval language of those three kingdoms. And okay. and it's extinct in Spain but lives on in Portugal. And we have the bagpipes there. And we have the bagpipes on this side of the border, on one kingdom, on, on the three kingdoms you have bagpipes. So it doesn't... So uh, is the language more like Spanish or is it totally... You know, Portuguese is so close to Spanish already that right. that's like an old version of both of sorts, okay. you know. Right. And then you have Galician, which is the mother of Portuguese, on the, on the another kingdom there. All right. And it's, it, well, it's fascinating. But in any case... Um, so, 20 years ago, I started listening to the recordings and I loved bagpipes, but I didn't know what to make of it because uh, I don't understand it. And then I would show it to someone, which was a musician already, and they said, well, it's out of tune. And I was like, mm. okay, but there's, there's something magical here and I don't understand what it is. And, and because I didn't know any better, I thought they have a special scale. They have something that no one has and so on. But as time went by, I couldn't understand it, and I tried to, to buy a bagpipe from there in the hopes that that instrument would play what was in, on the recording somehow, because the bagpipe I had didn't play what was on the recording. Oh, I see. Yeah, so, and I didn't know. You know, at the time, I didn't know what the minor scale was, what the major scale was. I just, and so people said, well, well, they went to the piano and they tried to find the notes on the recording, but the recording wasn't 440, so they would be in between the keys and yeah, they, they yeah. wouldn't know how to explain it to me, but said, well, it's out of tune, they would say. And then we say, well, it's kind of a major scale, but not really. And what I wanted to share with yes. you is that I gave up. <laughs> and it took 20 years now to go and well, not 20 years, but 15 or mm. to go like, oh, that's what it is. So I had to get enough information to understand what I was hearing. And what did you hear? What I understand now? Yes. Well, 
of course the recording is not 440 but you can just on a computer you can put it to 440 yeah. if you want to compare it yes. somehow or if you want to put all the recordings because you have several pipers playing on different pitches yes so you can put them all and then compare it and although they are in different pitches so they couldn't play together they are all playing the same scale and the, the deviations are very similar oh interesting you know so so you can trace the deviations and and you can understand and the, the pipers didn't know either so so they would say for example the drone is fighting the shanter so it's clashing so that was they they are they are having a fight they are having a, an argument the drone is having a, an argument so that means it's out of tune but the, is it are they especially tuning it that way or is they, it they are that? tuning it until they are not ar arguing anymore okay because they have no sense at the time they didn't have any sense of tuning or is it C or B flat they didn't know no no but so what, it, what I mean is that yeah. they, they, they tempered them to, to yeah. They, they, yeah yeah until you don't hear wah 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 yeah, yeah, wah, yeah. wah 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 then they are not arguing yeah, yeah, you understand so yes you, you, i do so the more i knew the less i could speak with the pipers be, because i would ask so sir is this in b flat and they said uh, they would kind of get a little bit maybe embarrassed because they didn't know what that was but yeah, the, yeah. then the generation start dying and and the, little by little they they died off and now it's us with the recording and so on but <laughs> enough about me what I wanted yeah, no, to no, no. what I wanted to tell you is that I have to recognize that I gave up and now I can continue because now I know better mm -hmm. but at one point I just played other kind of pipes and other kind of traditions that were let's sell, say more developed that people were actually had music schools and they had they had books I could read about those pipes so there was already a, a, a schooling system yes and not in my country. In my country, there was nothing. That's why all of us went to Galicia that was highly developed in terms of piping. And we got all the methods and all the systems and everything. Okay. And now, well, for the last 10 years or more, we, we're super interested in our culture because now we can try to understand it. But I have, yes. I have to say that I gave up at the point and now I'm, I'm back. And then I went back to it. So when I saw your recordings of the of the old ladies singing, I had the same feeling, and the feeling was I don't know how Pia does it because this is so hard. You know, it's like I, I feel like giving up already, giving up in the sense that I don't feel I will ever understand this, and that's what I felt yes. with the bagpipes. And now I know yes. that you can understand it. Yes. No. Uh, yes. Um. It's a good question. The thing is that, um, okay. Because let's say I'm just mm. take, taking another example. Let's say that uh, I'm a musician and mm -hmm. as a musician, you try to understand something that you hear. Mm. Uh, but let's say visual art. Let's mm -hmm. say you go to the exhibition and you see something on yeah. the wall. Me personally, I don't try to understand it. Okay. I'm just looking at it. It pleases me or it doesn't please me. If it doesn't please me, I have no scruples. I go further. <laughs> and, go, yeah. and then I see something. I might not be explaining what do I see, mm. but there's something that it fascinates me. Yes. And I can have this kind of childish like, not like. Mm interesting not interesting attitude towards that because yeah. i don't know anything yeah so when i first heard this music they're kind of you're absolutely right that there's there are levels of something which is very far from what you are used to here or something which is a little bit closer and so on and so on so when i heard first um the music in in the Nifk music in Salin, those people that were living and sang, I could somehow relate to that. There was some kind of understanding. Mm. But then I heard some of the older recordings, and there was, I was thinking, what is this? But it was fascinating. It was still mm. like that painting that yes. I don't understand what it's supposed to be, 
what is there, but it somehow pleases. There's something. And if we, if we took the music, all of it was like that for me first. Yeah. And the first thing, the initial thing is the fascination that you are mesmerized by it. this thing. You don't know what it is that actually you are mesmerized by, but there's something so intensive, so beautiful, although it doesn't follow any of the rules that you are used to in music. Yes. No, no. The pitch, I would say out of tune as well, it keeps gliding upwards. The rhythm, there's no patterns that I can pinpoint that that's this, that. And if I, when the, that by the time I try to, for example, notate it, I become totally desperate because yes. Today I listen this and I hear that. Tomorrow I listen it and I hear something else. And after tomorrow I listen and again hear something else. And I'm thinking, how could I possibly have heard that yesterday? Hmm. So <laughs> it's a process. And now I feel, if I look back and, and listen, um, it's not as strange anymore. Yes. So that happens. But one way I would like to keep that <laughs> strangeness in it. I understand what you mean. But <laughs> and, it, it goes away. A certain amount, but the new strange it is arrive. Okay, I said to you that it the music was one voice, yeah. and that, that the lack of harmony is the kind of the first thing that that you you face that there is no harmony. The se next thing that uh, you face is that there is this gliding pitch mm. that it gives that you feel the same kind of pattern goes. All the time, higher, higher, higher. I remember higher. asking you if yeah. that was something like the, the choirs do of, because of the intervals they get. Is it they, so they get, get, they get going higher because of the perfect fit? <laughs> <laughs> remember, but you said that it, did, it didn't seem like that. No, because there it, was it's, a so, sense of, it's so gradual. It's yeah. so uh, that when you listen it, you don't actually first notice it. But when you when you... After a while, you think, but this is not anymore the same. And if you compare with the beginning, then you realize, oh, it's not. Mm. So it is so, so great, like a shade changing in a mm. color or something. Yeah. And then the rhythm that... The, that uh, doesn't seem to relate. Somehow. No, it, because it doesn't have this kind of a certain... You can't divide it to, to something so small that then that you can kind of, from that, calculate everything. Yes. It doesn't exist there. But... When you have kind of come to you, that's how it is. Now, then suddenly I realized that all kind of this melisma, this little... Then I hear, mm. hmm, but they are not just somewhere. They seem to be... I see. Certain notes. And very seldom it's a second. It very often is fourth, from fourth down or okay. fifth down. Or, okay. or very often fourth from fourth up or something like that. The, it's not the or something. It's, okay. It's, and, and, but they, they're coming with, with such a fast, when you just hear it in a, quickly, you just think that it's something, oh, ew, ew. but yeah. it's not actually. When you really start to listen here, no, they are hitting actually certain notes. And then I started to question my concept of harmony. Yes. Is harmony something which is vertical happening at the same time? Or is it <laughs> horizontal? <laughs> So then I started to question this, that I say that it's the harmony is like, it's not lacking in it. It's just set in a different way. Wow. Hmm. And the other thing about this perfect fifth that you were talking about, um, I haven't, I have been searching it in their music. Um, and I think the reason that it's, Um, I don't see that it's lacking. Of course, there are fifths there, and so on. But um, the, if you have a drum, let's say, which has a very clear sound that you can sort of pinpoint that that's more or less the sound, because the drum mm -hmm. has several sounds at the same time, but yeah. there's a one sound that is dominating, then generally people start to relate to that. Yes. And they start to tune in, so to speak. And then in that case, what it. happens is that they still glide up. And they, they leave behind the, the drum? No, they don't. What they do is that they pick up that note, then but it ding, bing, 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 bing. all the time they pick up that drum sound. As that if they, it was a drum. 
Yes, exactly, as if yeah. it's a drum. Yes. But if the drum sound is that, oh, let's say that you drum one place, I noticed that also I have a recording where the lady, it's a very kind of resonant drum, which has a very kind of distinctive pitch, but then he, she starts to play it in her other place, and it goes down, boom, or something, boom, and suddenly she gets confused for a while where to start her singing. I see. So she kind of reacts to that. But then there are certain people that they don't seem to have any, any relation. But on the other hand, we have also people that wow. we, so to speak, sing out of tune and it's like... <laughs> I can edit that out if you want. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, um, so uh, again, these things which is out of tune and all of these kind of or overtones. For mm. example, uh, there's so many overtones that, for example, when I play in violin, I hear sometimes overtones and I see when I'm playing in for harmonizing, mm. or the undertones. Yes. And then there's another interesting thing with, with, you actually mentioned to me once, remember you saw this film where this lady was uh, singing um, and you you kind of know paid attention that she was holding her mm. her stomach so yes. big, and you felt that it, she's picking up some reverberation or something mm. like that, some kind of a, and that's why um, there's so many. Is perfect fifth? Let's say I'm just taking going back mm. to like, a, yeah, like yeah. an example. Is that something which has happened in a purified world, so to speak? <laughs> Hmm. Where there are no other songs interfering, but let's say while you already hmm. have four no, uh, four uh, strings. strings, which are so-called tuned in perfect fifths. Hmm. But I, when I tune, I always try to make them narrow. Narrow you perfect try to, fifth. You try to make them narrow. narrower than the perfect. But I call it narrow perfect fifth. It's I can't explain it. But it's something to do with the overall resonance because the other open strings, they interfere with that feeling of the instrument being on two. If I had only instrument with two strings, yes, it would be different experiment when so, I have four. Strings. So you don't you don't tune them pure. I I think that I do, but you, I feel that they are two fifths, and I I can't. This is this. I, I can't analyze it. I can't explain because it. Okay, because yeah, that's the problem with when we, everyone with everyone when we start speaking. So my sense is that if you play them together, the yes. two strings, yes, and you tune them until there is no clashing noise sound mm -hmm. until they are pure, yes, then you have a pure fifth. Yes, that pure fifth is slightly wider than in a piano. Yeah, 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 no, it's just, let's forget well, about yeah. Well, with, yeah. it's slightly longer than, very slightly, it's very slightly nowadays, uh, it's very slightly longer than people would consider it to be proper nowadays in equal temperament. Yeah, but I can't, so I can't you're I saying you're saying that understand you're this equal temperament. It's, yeah, it's total it's, crap, none of us. <laughs> <laughs> I can edit that out also if you no, want. No, you don't have <laughs> Yeah, so, so you're, you say that you're making it narrower. Yes. And I tell you, the thing is that if I was just tuning two notes... Narrow, yes, because... But I had this other, let's say that I tune first, I start with D and G, I tune them. D and I, I, I start with A generally, because A you get the tuning fork yes, or something, yes. A, and then I do D down. A, D, but that, is that an inverted fifth? No, is downward, so that's perfect fifth, A to D. Okay, that's, okay. Yes. And then from D, I have tuned that, and then I do D. And, and you say that you put them slightly narrower. Yes, because all those notes, even if I play them, the others are resonant, resonating. Okay. And they are in the field. Oh, yes, yes, they are. Yes. And that's why I wonder if it's something to do with that, and especially the E. Oh, then I go okay. A, E. And if I would be doing them like the wide, so called ideal, yeah. perfect fifth. Yeah. Yes. The between the G and the E, there would be such a difference okay. that they so, wouldn't so, resonate, so, so, the whole so, instrument wouldn't resonate anymore. Okay, so you temper them. I somehow temper, but yes. how? 
yeah, yeah. It's just in so so in a sense you are you are very carefully untuning the fifth. Somehow, yes. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. But if if I let let's say that you take some something like bagpipes yeah. where you have this one pipe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you the have drone. the drone. Yeah. And then you do it. That drone is that is that one note. Yes. You don't have two drones, do you? I can have three. You can. In octaves or fifths. Yeah, but fifths. Yeah. But still fifths. You don't have a. Yeah, Let's but it's say. not the same. It's, it's like different instruments. Yeah. I don't have that 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 contamination that you have in the violin. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. for sure, for sure. So that's that's the difference, and therefore. But when the, yeah, there's other things. Yes. Because, for example, I make it too long. I make my fifth longer than it should. Bigger, la larger. Mm. And why would you do that? I don't know, but I notice that I do that. And the other thing is that my my drones are in different octaves, so there might that might have to something to do with it and it might become like something like psychoacoustics and not really um, you understand it's my it's it's you mean that the octave is not pure it's in my case is longer than pure octave no no oh the octaves are pure no no the octaves are I pure see. but my fifth so i have let's say a c yes as a drone yes then let's say i have for example another c an yes. octave apart as yes. a drone and then my melody goes one octave over that. Yes. And then I have the C again, and then I have one octave. Yes. So my G on my chanter, that G is higher than pure. So pure would be higher already to equal temperament, and my, mine is slightly even higher. And it pleases you better. Yeah. So... But this is but, there you are. So but from the temperament, from keyboards uh, theory, they say like you're creating problems. So pure is a problem. We are lowering our, our we are lowering our fifths in order to have a, a functioning keyboard. Yeah, but because so you're, you're changing the key all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes. So you're doing it. You're you're having it purer than pure, <laughs> so longer than uh, wider than pure. So you're yeah. creating problems. Yes, I am. Uh, but in a sense, yeah. I'm working within one octave and so on. But uh, and also, as in violin, you can use it when you want and not use it when you don't want because you can move your finger, right? Exactly. Yes. And I can change the pressure. Yes. Yes. So I don't use. Maybe I don't use it all the time. Yes. Um, but those are very interesting things. So yeah. that therefore, and it was last seminar I was talking about this, this third, which was mm. between my minor major third. Yeah. And. Uh, I have still difficulties to produce that, I see. to play it, yeah. because although I hear it, it it's just my upbringing is still yes, so yes. much. Uh, yeah. uh, I know violinists who can do that, folk violinists they can do it, okay. and I admire it. But I I for me it's just that I play out of tune. But mm. then I hear somebody doing it; it's wonderful. Mm. So that is those are the those are the things where. I think that if you go back to this music that I am studying, I think that the hearing is, they, they, they are, for example, the ideal of, a, of voice is not one. Mm. It, there's always some kind of a, yes. a vibrato, something in yeah. it, something mm. that is in it. And therefore... I think that they're, because they have very kind of sonor sonority in there, that they're picking up those resonances from somewhere. Yes. Yeah. That I'm sure. And yeah. that's why these melismat, they are doing it. They are, that is my, my opinion at the moment. Will I change it again? I don't know. Hmm. That they are actually creating harmonies that way. Oh. Although the voice, one voice, you can't. I mean, it doesn't last. If you then sing another voice, the other one disappears. <laughs> But it's yeah. in their head. Yes. Mm. So. <laughs> now it's so interesting. And I have one question for you, which has to do with this sense of, of not giving up. Um, do you think it, it took someone like you, in a sense, or someone with your background, let me put it, 
Mario. Do you think it's because of your background that you are so fascinating with that? Because I, what I see is someone that studied so much of what uh, music can produce that you have a fair library of what are the rules and which composer broke the rules. So you have a very complete library of musical possibilities to a point where it takes a lot to impress you, let's be honest. Mm. Right? So in order to get fascinated and impressed, those people broke further, uh, way more rules than most of contemporary composers in a way, because when you yes. start saying, well, there's no vertical harmony, but maybe then you go like, okay. Yes. So it's, it's is, is that, do you think that could be? That, um, of, for example, I, to get fascinating with that, while in my pass, in my path, through music, along the way, I'll get fascinated with lots of stuff if I start really looking at, at the world of music. Do you understand what I mean? I, yeah. If I dive deep into the classical right now, mm. I'll still discover for many years lots of, of new stuff because I'm not into that world that much. It, so it takes less maybe to fascinate me than it takes you. You understand uh, what I mean I do in that sense? Uh, yes, I do understand. From, from an from from intellectual, let's say, yeah, standpoint. Yeah. Maybe. I would just say that probably, it, the, let's say, finish mm. the folk music professionals, if they would have, let's say a singer, folk mm. singer, mm. had gone to Chukotka, mm. um, or let's say a folk violinist, mm. what would they have paid, it, what, where would their attention have been? I don't mm. know. Yeah. It probably, they would have, because that's why that's I still call it the hearing angles, uh, aspects of hearing. Mm. They probably have heard something else, or the the tension would have been, attention would have been on something else than mine, maybe, because there's certain background knowledge would would. Um, they would have known certain things that. <laughs> the knowledge is a dangerous thing because mm. one can be easily say that yes. Okay, this is this, I put this to this category. Yes, yes, exactly. But if you don't know anything, then it's like an open book. Yeah, exactly. And I have been a bit worried uh, in the very beginning of my study, especially that, um, as we go to this philosophy lessons and all these concepts and concepts and this and that and the other, that am I going to kind of create a set of boxes in front of mm. me? Mm. And start to file yes. my knowledge. Yeah. Is that it, is that what is this doctorate is going to mean mm. for me? Yeah. And I'm actually quite happy that I started so late that I was so deep into that music yes. before I started uh, my doctoral studies, because mm. it might have happened. I, I read something that I read quote earlier in the, like the beginning. Some of my like this optimist uh, like this, you know this. Uh, then you go to a course and then you have to write something what you have learned or something. And I'm embarrassed because I am, I'm trying to understand these words like concept and conceptualize <laughs> and, and, yes. and I was so naively openly using things for example. I remember the very first time, Vesa you know very mm -hmm. well, mm -hmm. he was and, and Heike who is not at the moment with Heike women, they, they were in the first um, seminar where I ever, ever presented, my, I showed my paper, mm -hmm. and I was totally, I was saying all these things, that this is authentic, this is pure, this is crap, uh, all the, and, and, and all this, <laughs> on what grounds, and, and, and I got this cold shower back at me, yeah. to, and, and it started to make me careful with words, and I, one stage I was thinking, okay, so, what is a good doctor or student? A good doctor or student is who doesn't who doesn't dare to say anything because it might be wrong. <laughs> but um, that's why I am thinking my own writing that I have to find my own way mm. that it not play in a, in a, you know the game of being academic. Yes. When I'm not, if that is not my language, then mm. it's not that I don't 
and to understand the processes with science academic uh, thinking. And that, it has helped me a lot as well. But at the same time, I think that, that uh, those people have so much to say themselves. Yes. That I can't look at the culture and the music through the lens of the Western philosophers, let's say. Yes, for example. Only, only. Yes. Yeah. Maybe that's in one angle, but it's one angle only. But uh, wow. it remains to be seen. <laughs> Can I? I'm, I'm not very... I don't write writing. I hate writing, actually. So <laughs> that is a... I have to provoke myself to write. I'm glad you like talking. <laughs> yes, talking is my problem. <laughs> <laughs> We're probably over one yes, hour already. probably. Thank you so much. And Thank you. I, this won't be the, the last time, I think. Okay. We sit down and speak about this because so much, so much has been left unsaid yet. But, um, yeah, it's thought-provoking. I don't have any questions. Okay. Just the tea. All right. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm curious about you and kind of your career and your story and everything and what you've been doing. If you don't have any questions, then I start to ask about wood. <laughs>